Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Joanne Paano, the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the National Network for Youth. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your days to join us for today's webinar. We will be getting shortly in two minutes to give folks a chance to hop on today's webinars. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Can everyone hear me? I hope so. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we are expecting a couple of more people to join, um, but we are gonna go ahead and get started. Wanting to be mindful of everyone's time. You have all joined us for a webinar on the new white paper that we are launching today um, on de accurately defining homelessness, a first step towards ending youth homelessness. I'm gonna go to the next slide. We'll start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the GoToWebinar platform, uh, you should be seeing a box Similar to this on your screen, um, all of our attendees should be muted um, so that there isn't any background noise. And um, myself and the other three panelists um, are unmuted so we can participate throughout. If you um, have a question, we definitely want you to ask it. So you should see um, a chat box where you can type in a question and please send it to the entire audience so that everybody sees it. And feel free to type your questions in the chat box and share throughout the duration of the webinar. We will get to question and answer at the end of the webinar. And uh, this webinar will be archived and we will share out a link um, to this webinar um, so that if you have to leave earlier for folks who are unable to come, they'll still be able to get the content from today's webinar. So what we're gonna be talking about today, this is the introduction part, and we'll do introductions of the panelists next. Um, but the second part, we'll be talking about what the research and lived experience tells us about how youth and young, young families experience homelessness, then we're going to go over what are the current federal definitions of homelessness um, and in what ways are they different. Then we're going to spend time talking about why definitions matter. And then the final chapter, we'll be talking about um, some federal advocacy that you could do um, to align the different definitions. And then we will finish with Q&A. So please definitely uh, chat us your questions throughout. So now we're gonna go to introductions. Sierra. Hi there. Um, my name is Sierra Bowen. Um, I'm from Orlando, Florida. And yeah. Great. Thank you, Sade. Hello, everyone. I'm Sade Hamilton. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I work alongside with the night ministry and i am on the council with the national network for youth thanks Sharde. han hi my name is han johnson i'm from ogden uh utah i'm also a part of the youth council for the national network for youth and i also work locally with the shelter youth futures here in ogden great all right, so now we are going to dive in to what the research and lived experience tells us about how youth and young adults experience homelessness. 
and I'm gonna turn it over to Han. So if you head on down to slide seven, I don't know if that shows on their screens, but uh, slide seven in the PowerPoint, we're looking at these statistics, right? So roughly 4.2 million youth and young adults are unaccompanied and homeless. And 3.5 million of those are between the ages of 18 and 25. And 700,000 of those are between the ages of 13 and 17. So that's a large chunk of youth that aren't getting the access to the resources they need because of these definitions. Um, if you look, 50 on the next slide, 50% of these young adults and 75% of minors are reporting explicit homelessness and 50% of young adults and 25% of minors are couch surfing. So those couch surfers aren't getting access to the resources because of these definitions and that's putting them in even riskier situations and making it harder for them to succeed in life. Um, my friend Alyssa, who I had the pleasure of growing up with, was couch surfing throughout high school. And because of that, she wasn't able to get like the proper housing or the proper like medical care and other stuff that I was able to get because I was in shelter. And that really detrimentally affected her life now. Yeah, it's not great. Um, on slide number nine, we can see like the youth most likely to be experiencing this homelessness. So youth with less than a high school diploma, which at my shelter is most the youth. I mean, you can't get a high school diploma until you finish school. And in order to finish school, you need to have stable housing, right? Uh, youth of color, LGBTQ youth, myself and Alyssa included, unmarried, unmarried and parenting youth, which is a large portion in Utah. Surprisingly, we have a very high teen pregnancy rate. Um, and youth who have been in foster care, which is also a large portion of our population that we need to be accounting for in these definitions. Thank you, Han. Uh, this slide really shows, um, as Han was explaining, and the research shows, how fluid homelessness is as an experience for young people. And this slide isn't to indicate that it's linear, um, but this really is to show that there are multiple forms of homelessness that young people and families experience. Um, and just to highlight again, 72% of young people who experience street, shelter, or car homelessness also said that they had stayed with others while homeless, meaning couch surfing um, and, and staying with others because they had nowhere else to go. Um, so these are all different um, forms of homelessness and, and young people and families, they go from one homeless situation to another um, in a very fluid manner. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Charday who's gonna share with you a little bit about her journey. Oh, do y'all see them beautiful kids? Um, so I was homeless at 17. I stayed in an abandoned hall. Um, I was, I had my daughter at the time and I was pregnant with my son. Um, I was in the abandoned hall for nine months. Um, I wasn't able to obtain an ID or birth certificate or anything because it wasn't my home that I was in. Um, throughout me staying in the home, I had became, um, DCFS had came into custody of my daughter because you know, the utilities was off. Um, I didn't have no hot water. I wasn't able to um, really take care of her like a mother should. So DCFS had came in and took my daughter. Um, when they came and took Giselle, that's her name, when it came into Giselle, um, I was hopeless. Like I, I felt like I lost everything. So my DCFS worker contacted me with a um, referral to the Teen Living Program. I went to the TLP out in Chicago, and they wasn't really able to help me because it wasn't a shelter. It was a drop-in center, but they had resources to tell me about a shelter. So um, 
so since I was pregnant at the time, I was able to go to the Night Ministry Young Parent Parent and Parenting Program, and I was able to start my life over there at the Night Ministry. I was able to stay there um, without having to leave every day. Um, it was a 180-day program, but they prolonged it for me because I was following my goals. So after I stayed there for nine months, um, I obtained my first two-bedroom apartment, which I still live in to this day. Um, the main ministry helped me get an ID. My birth certificate, they helped me get my kids' ID, well, birth certificates and social. So that's my son, little Freddie, and that's my daughter, Giselle. Thank you, Sade. And this is a quote from one of our young leaders um, who shared that the open sky never made me bleed. And the context of this quote from one of our young people is she was she actually fled uh, an abusive home life um, and slept outdoors. And she felt much sleep, uh, safer sleeping outside in a place unfit for human habitation than she felt sleeping indoors in a nice house in a nice neighborhood where she was being abused. And this is just to illustrate um, around vulnerability and that where a young person or anybody finds um, a place to sleep at night is, is not indicative of their level of vulnerability. Which is a nice segue into talking more about what the research says around vulnerability and how it um, vulnerability does not depend on where a young person lays their head at night. Um, the Center for Disease Control, more commonly known as the CDC, um, it has youth risk behavior survey data. Um, and this is this research that I'm talking about is specifically from 17 states that captured all of this same data. And the data is around youth vulnerability to violence, suicide, substance abuse, hunger, bullying, and lack of sleep. Um, and it was comparable across different homeless situations, the different types of homelessness um, that young people experience. And for every risk behavior study, the incidence among students in any of the different types of homeless living situations was significantly higher than that of their housed peers. And uh, for example, from this report, the following percentages of students in each of these homeless situations reported having been raped. So that's 32% of young people um, living in places unfit for human habitation, um, such as the streets, 25% of young people staying in shelters, 20% of those temporarily staying with others because they have nowhere else safe to live, 32% of people living in cars or places unfit for human habitation, and 26% of young people staying in motels or hotels. Um, so you can see um, the level of vulnerability here um, as compared to uh, the housed peer, peers. So this is, uh, now we're moving to our third chapter, uh, the current federal definitions of homelessness. And I am gonna turn it over to Sierra. Alrighty, um, hi guys. So when we're talking about the federal definition of homelessness, there actually is no single federal definition of homelessness. They kind of go based off of three different ones, but they're not all the same. They all have some differences to them. Um, now, when we scroll down to seven, um, page 17 and 18, these are actually just going to be um, page, actually the things that are in the packet for the white paper uh, definition. It's in that packet there. Um, that's just some of the publications that we put in there. Um, it's basically just going over the exact details and everything it states in the policy itself. Um, and then when we go down to slide 19, you're gonna notice the key differences in the definitions themselves between housing and urban development, the health and the education aspect. 
um, they kind of don't always take the youth safety in a sense, um, in my opinion and from my experience. Um, and they don't always treat youth that the same is what I'm trying to say, excuse me. They treat youth who don't have permanent and stable homes, but they are staying in other homes due to lack of alternatives. Um, like for example, my brother and I would stay in very unsafe environments just to kind of have a couch to sleep on, you know, or something like a floor, anything's better than, you know, sleeping in a park or in your car. Um, and then how they treat youth who stay in motels due to lack of adequate alternative um, accommodations. They don't always consider someone who sleeps in a hotel, um, you know, homeless if they pay for it themselves. So if they're able to scrape together enough money, they're not able to qualify for a lot of things through HUD like they would through other services. Um, now, when we go down to slide 20, you're going to go ahead and we're going to see the definition of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So you obviously have the unsheltered locations, i.e. a car, a park, um, you know, living in trans, uh, transitional housing, emergency housing. You also see the motels and hotels, like I stated before, and then staying with others due to lack of options. So couch surfing. And then it's also going to be pretty much the same for the U.S. Department of Education, which will be on slide 21. Um, and then now we're just going to continue on to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We're going to see that that definition is not as like it's very it's not as specific as we need it to be. It kind of cancels out a lot of options for many people. Um, so basically, you have to be living in a car, or in a park, but living in emergency shelters and transitional housing only. So that leaves people who pay for their own hotel if they're able to scrape enough money, that excludes them as well as someone who would be couch surfing. <clears throat> now when we go down to the next slide here, um, you're going to see that people, like I stated before about a little bit about myself, is my brother and I, we wouldn't, we didn't qualify for anything like that because we would just stay with friends or wherever is safe. Um, so while some categories of HUD's definition may appear to be broader on the paper, you know, the categories two, three, and four, because of regulations in reality, HUD's definition ends up being just the streets and the shelter, which excludes so many people and just kind of puts a damper on, you know, these services for people who do need them. Now on 24, we put they put together this lovely little flow chart and it basically just explains what you have to do to qualify for HUD. So basically, if you, you know, you see a lot of red here, so there's a lot of things that's gonna exclude you from being able to use these services even though you do need them. <clears throat> Let's see. And then if we go ahead and then we're gonna scroll down to this little slide here, slide 25, you're gonna see that, okay, if you sleep on a park bench or a shelter, you qualify. But if you sleep on someone's couch, you don't qualify. And then you do qualify if you are sleeping in your car. But for a hotel, like we stated again, I'm going to say that if you pay for it yourself, you're not able to qualify, even if, you know, you're getting that money, but just by someone, you know, just being nice and giving you and helping you out. Or if you're, you know, just kind of on the side of the road trying to get money so you have a safe place to live, you know, and you get lucky enough to get enough money for a motel or a hotel, you still just won't qualify. And then that explains that some more down on page 26 and like I said third-party payments are the only way that you would be considered homeless under HUD definition and if you make direct payments that means you're not homeless even if you are so and I think that's all I got here yes thank you Sierra um, mm -hmm. 
Now we're gonna move on to why definitions matter. So I'm sure many of you on this webinar already understand the realities of why definitions matter. Um, so when definitions reflect the way that adults and not youth experience homelessness, youth will be undercounted and underserved, as you've heard from all three of um, our young leaders who have been presenting today. And when definitions or prioritizations based on definitions include individuals who have experienced some form of homelessness but not others, we as a community and as a country lose the opportunity to prevent youth who may be facing homelessness for the first time from becoming the next generation of chronically homeless adults. So our goal, the goal is that HUD's definition of homeless should be aligned um, with other definitions to include the ways that youth and family often experience homelessness, including couch surfing and staying in motels, even if they're paying for it themselves. Uh, some of the barriers um, that are in existence through HUD policy and regulation is that while the statute does authorize HUD to allow communities to serve youth, families, individuals, um, who are considered homeless under other federal definitions. This is what we um, often refer to as category three. Um, you have to be considered homeless under another federal defi definition, plus have moved, plus have two or more disabilities. And further, um, HUD has used its administrative authority to limit the eligibility in this category to only a few of its programs and communities has to have to ask HUD permission to serve category three with um, and only use 10% of its funds, that's through statute. And HUD has not granted one community um, who has asked permission to do so. So there are communities who've taken a vote who have said we do wanna use um, up to 10% of our continuum of care dollars to serve category three um, homeless individuals, plus having moved, plus having two or more disabilities, and HUD has not given one community permission to do so, even when asked. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, the importance of definitions in terms of data and numbers. Um, I think a lot of people understand um, that funding decisions at a local and a federal level are often driven by the point in time count. Um, we have the next point in time count comes up in January. Um, it is fundamentally flawed methodology for accurately scoping um, the number of young people experiencing homelessness. It's fundamentally flawed in scoping the number of families who are experiencing homelessness, because those two populations um, really do are not as visibly homeless um, as the chronically homeless adult population. So some of the limitations, we know that our young people try not to be visible. Um, and if there's only an adult shelter, it's rare that you're gonna find young people. We know a lot of young people do not feel safe um, staying in adult programs or adult shelters. We also know that homelessness um, through the Chapin Hall research has been found to be equally prevalent in rural and urban communities for young people. Um, and rural communities often may receive less federal funding because they're less able to count all of those in their community who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and there's uh, a little bit, we wanna talk a little bit about eligibility versus prioritization. So aligning the different federal definitions of homelessness doesn't mean that everyone will automatically be served. What it would mean is that youth would be eligible to be assessed for services, um, which is what we want. Because like the data showed, um, vulnerability, um, which the, the, by and large, the current assumption in the homelessness space is that those who are living in places unfit for human habitation are more vulnerable than the other hidden forms of homelessness, even though research 
And data has shown the opposite, has shown that's not true at all. That homelessness is a very fluid experience and that um, people and young people don't just experience one form of homelessness, um, but also that the different forms of homelessness, there are very high levels of vulnerability. And we really think that aligning definitions would allow communities to develop more comprehensive community responses that's actually inclusive of all forms of homelessness. And by better prioritizing services among individuals who are currently um, experiencing homelessness and painting a truer picture of the overall need through real data and real numbers, we, the collective we, um, communities, providers, and the country um, can do a better job at interrupting the cycle in which young people experience homelessness, fail to receive the needed assistance, and then become adults who experience homelessness, often with their children and often with um, more severe needs. So for us, um, the graphic on the left, this is the goal that we are actually creating youth centric systems that are built around the multiple forms of homelessness that young people um, experience and that we're providing all the wraparound services around that of which housing is just one. Um, supportive services, education, workforce development, job attainment, those are all of equal importance when we're really trying to implement a comprehensive approach um, to addressing homelessness for young people. So this kind of naturally flows into um, federal advocacy to align the different definitions of homelessness. And we really want to start off with um, different perspectives. Um, so the National Network for Youth, we are a national membership organization. We represent over 300 runaway and homeless youth providers and school districts from across the country. Uh, we partner with our National Youth Advisory Council, three of which you've heard from today. Uh, we have over 25 young people who serve on our National Youth Advisory Council at any given time and an alumni network of our Youth Advisory Council. So we wanna start with sharing different perspectives um, from the people that we partner with uh, across the country. So this is um, a service provider's perspective from Melinda, Melinda who runs Youth Care in Seattle. She's also the chair of my board. And she says, the young people that we serve who are in temporary, who are temporarily staying with others are in inherently unstable situations. They lack certainty over how long they can remain in that setting. Their arrangements are subject to change with little to no choice. And the people they're staying with are often unwilling to provide written notice for fear of risking their lease or public benefits. Mm -hmm. The next perspective comes from a homeless liaison in San Antonio, Texas. And she says, there is not a doubled up population and a shelter population. There is a homeless population. Families and youth can't find space in the shelter system, so they have to double up. Or the shelters don't serve families or unaccompanied minors, so they have to double up. And then, um, Sierra? Yes, so this is one of the quotes I found it just fit the most for me personally, because it's very relatable. It's from Brittany Kay from Ohio. She said, none of the people I lived with would have been willing to document that I was living there. They would have been suspicious and afraid of getting in trouble. Also, many of them didn't, many of them I didn't know well enough to ask them. So, in situations like this, you know, you see youth putting themselves at risk and staying somewhere just so they don't have to sleep outside, whether it's cold, it's hot, you know, they're putting themselves at risk either way, you know? So I feel like if someone is going to be sleeping on a bench and risking their life and also just staying with random friends or just strangers, you know, anywhere, why wouldn't they qualify for HUD, you know? That's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is from um, U.S. Representative Steve Stivers from Ohio. He says, if we can't get the numbers right, we can't know what the resources need to be. 
and give our communities more flexibility so they can choose how to address this growing problem and give policymakers the information they need to get the resources that we need to combat homelessness. So we're going to talk a little bit about the Homeless Children and Youth Act um, and why uh, this um, law is so needed. So currently HUD's definition of homelessness excludes most, most children and youth whose families pay for a motel room or who must stay with other people temporarily because there is nowhere else to go. Under HUD's current statutory definition, children and youth in such living situations are not eligible. HUD added many more restrictions via regulation and the funding application, which is commonly known as the NOFA. As a result, these families and youth are not even assessed on their vulnerability for services. Other federal programs recognize that children and youth in such living situations are homeless, which is what um, you heard about earlier in terms of uh, the HHS definition and uh, US Department of Education definition. So what would the Homeless Children and Youth Act do? So uh, the first issue it would address is HUD's narrow and arbitrary definition of homelessness excludes some of the most vulnerable children, youth, and families. So what the Homeless Children and Youth Act would do is it would align HUD's definition of homelessness with the definitions used by other federal programs. So if you are considered homeless by the McKinney-Vento um, Education Act, uh, then you would be eligible to be assessed um, for services by the HUD Homelessness Assistance Grant Program. Similar, if you were considered homeless according to the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, Health Care for the Homeless Act, Violence Against Women Act. Um, uh, the second one is, second problem that HCYA would address is there are federal mandates that incentivize and force um, communities to prioritize programs, specific housing models for certain populations and program models regardless of local needs and program effectiveness. So what HCYA would do is it would require HUD to score local applications primarily on whether they are cost effective in meeting the priorities and goals that the community identifies in their local plans, as opposed to um, from the federal government. Uh, the third problem that HCYA would address is uh, HUD's data keeps many youth, children, and families invisible and limits public and private action to help them. Uh, HCYA would improve HUD homeless data by requiring that communities include children, youth, and families who meet any part of the newly amended definition of homelessness in local counts. Uh, there are ways you can take action to help advocate for the Homeless Children and Youth Act. You can learn more about it on our website. Uh, please contact your U.S. representative and ask them to co-sponsor the Homeless Children and Youth Act. You can add your name as an organization that endorses this legislation. And stay tuned, um, we are expecting a Senate bill um, to be introduced, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. And now we are going to um, move to Q&A. So, um, Please, if you have any questions, um, please type them in the chat box so I can keep uh, folks on mute. And then um, myself and the other panelists will answer all of your questions. I'm gonna just wait one moment. Joanne's gonna help us moderate. Hello. We are coming through. Oh. We're coming through the questions to see if anyone has typed them in. Not seeing any right now. So folks, if you do have any questions with regard to any of the information or content that you've seen today, please feel free to go ahead and type your questions into the chat box. Oh, I do see one question from Bonita. Um, 
Oh, there are questions under in the questions section, Joanne. Someone did ask, um, it was my understanding that the federal agencies were working on aligning the definitions. Um, so just wanted to flag that. Um, so um, I'm not aware of that. Um, and I don't, it's not, it's not federal agency action. So let me back up. So the Homeless Children, Children and Youth Act, um, which I just presented on, would help address um, the statutory issues that exist within the existing law that governs the homeless assistance grant programs. Um, regulations and NOFA make the challenges of the law worse. So um, HUD does have authority to amend regulation and to change things on the NOFA. Um, but I'm not aware that any of that is going to happen. Um, but I guess the larger point is we really do need Congress to act as well as HUD. Sorry, what's the next question? Yep, so the next question from one of our participants, and this question is probably for you, Darla, who is resisting the potential change and what kind of opposition might the Homeless Children and Youth Act face? Who's resistant to this change? Yes. Uh, so uh, the National Alliance to End Homelessness does oppose the Homeless Children and Youth Act. Some of the arguments that they will put forth is this really, there isn't enough money, um, this will overwhelm the system. Uh, right now, current law and policy is really targeting limited resources on the most vulnerable of those who are experiencing homelessness. We do not agree with the National Alliance and Homelessness's position. It's not just about resources. Um, it, and we think that, and research shows that many uh, of the most vulnerable who are currently experiencing homelessness are not eligible and they're not even being assessed for services, which from our perspective is very problematic. We also know from data um, that, you know, from different communities, King County and LA County, their data shows that upwards to 40% of their chronically homeless adult population first experienced homelessness as young people. So from our perspective and increasingly what we're hearing from Chapin Hall and other esteemed researchers in this space is that if we're going to really move the dial on chronic chronically homeless adults in this country, then we have got to intervene early. And existing policy under HUD actually mandates and requires long-term suffering and chronicity before you are prioritized um, for the resources. The other kind of counter argument to what the National Alliance to End Homelessness will say is, well, there's only two point some billion dollars at the federal level, so we need to target those resources to those in the highest need. And we certainly want um, everybody with high needs to be served, but it is not just two point um, several billion dollars going to fund the continuums of care. States and cities are investing billions, millions and billions of their own dollars into this, this same system using the same definition, focusing um, their dollars and their prioritization on chronically homeless um, adults as opposed to also serving young people and families who are in very serious and vulnerable situations. Great, and thank you everyone for typing in your questions. We do see them um, coming along. So the next question is still on the topic of HCYA. One of our participants asked, what would be the benefit for very rural communities in terms of the Homeless Children and Youth Act? Yeah, so it would actually benefit rural communities a lot. What, we're, what we see through HUD regulation and primarily through the NOFA is a very urban-centric, urban-focused um, um, approach to homelessness. And what the Homeless Children and Youth Act would do is it would actually restore local control, power, and decision making. So we would, the law would acknowledge um, the local community as experts um, over uh, their, their homelessness problem. And they could then say, hey, this is, this is what um, we need to fund. We need to fund transitional housing or we need to fund um, permanent housing or whatever it is. 
and they would set their own benchmarks, their own priorities, and say, these are the programs that we need to fund because this is what would work in my rural community. Um, and they would be able to pull down dollars from the federal government that would actually fit the needs of their community. Great. And then the next question appears to expand more broadly um, in terms of alignment, the different federal definitions. The question from our participant is, where is USICH on this? Again, on the topic of federal alignment. Uh, I don't think USICH has a formal position um, on the Homeless Children and Youth Act. I know that they had been doing work just around like info sharing around the differences in I don't know definitions per se, but definitely in like what the different federal programs fund and do or do not do. Uh, I do think that was just going to include statute and not regulation and funding um, applications, which we, the National Network for Youth did encourage um, USICH to also include regulation and um, applications because that does provide um, priority and a lot further restrictions on what just the, the federal law says. Great. And then we have a question from a viewer who asked around the timing of reintroduction of the Homeless Children Youth Act and when that took place. Yeah. So the House bill uh, was introduced earlier this year. I forget when. Um, we are ex hoping that the Senate bill will be introduced this month. Um, and if not this month, then early next month, we will um, send out an alert whenever um, the Senate version is introduced. And we will encourage all of you to get both of your senators to join as co-sponsors. Um, and definitely you can reach out to your House, US House representatives today and get them um, to join as a co-sponsor to the House bill. Our understanding is that the Senate version will be identical um, to the House version, but again, we don't um, have details on timing just yet. Great, and it appears to be a few questions on whether the, a copy of the recording of this webinar, slides and the full white paper will become available for folks. Yes, so we'll definitely be pushing out um, the white paper, and I'm not sure if Joanne will be able to share the link to the white paper in the chat box, but it is on our website already. It's um, under Take Action in our Policy Brief section. Uh, we are pushing it out on social media um, uh, at a little after four today, and uh, once we... Um, get the uh, rec webinar recording squared away, we are going to add the link um, to this webinar recording um, in the same place on our website that we have the paper in our policy briefs section under the take action part of our page. And again, and we'll also um, push that out over social media. Yep, and for folks who are interested in taking a look at our fact sheets and issue briefs um, on this topic, as well as our upcoming um, publications, please feel free to look at the chat box on your screen where you'll see a direct link to our website and also the different publications, including the white paper on the federal definitions here that we presented on today. So I don't see any other questions unless folks had any other um, points of clarification or inquiry that they wanted to ask? And I do, I do apologize, just while folks are thinking of other questions, I do apologize that folks couldn't see the slides. <laughs> My computer was apparently having a moment. Um, but we'll make sure that all of that um, is shared with you all. Have any more questions come in? I don't see any others. Okay, well, while we're waiting, um, I wanna let you all know about um, another webinar that we have coming up on December 12th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We did just release a publication um, called Families First Prevention Services Act, Implications for Addressing Youth Homelessness. The Families First Prevention Services Act was a pretty significant foster care reform bill, really trying to focus um, child welfare dollars more upstream in prevention. Um, and we did, we partnered with Child Focus, who's amazing, and we did a lot of one-on-one -on -one interviews with experts 
uh, service providers from the youth homelessness space, child welfare space, young people who've experienced homelessness, and we put together this publication. You can download this paper. It is on our website at the same link that Joanne shared in the chat box. Um, and you can sign up um, for this webinar to learn more, to ask us questions. It'll be both Child Focus and the National Network for Youth um, who present on that webinar. I also wanted to flag that our 2020 National Summit on Youth Homelessness, this is our seventh annual summit, will take place in Washington, D.C. on March 2nd and 3rd. Uh, and we'd love to have you all come to DC and take part in our summit. We do have an education track during that summit that uh, Schoolhouse Connection co-sponsors. We also offer um, an optional, you can extend um, your stay to March 4th and you can take our certificate on human trafficking training. It really was developed for runaway and homeless youth providers. That's a partnership that the network has with the McCain Institute. We are also kicking off our annual membership drive. Um, so we are encouraging folks to renew or join as a member of the National Network for Youth for 2020. If you join now, you get the rest of November and all of December 2019 for free. Our membership dues are based on uh, the size of like your annual budget, your revenue, and it goes anywhere from 200 to $2,000 per year. This is a little bit more about resources. Um, definitely connect with us on social media, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And I think most of you must be signed up for our MailChimp, but you can always um, sign up to join our e-newsletter list also on our website. Um, that's how you can find out information um, about the work that we're doing. Have any more questions come in, Joanne? And only two other questions that I see um, are relating to the national data at the point in time count, which I think given the um, issues that we were having with the screens earlier, again, we do apologize to folks that the content wasn't visible. But once we do um, share it with you all, you can always reach out to us through the email address that you see there at the bottom, info at nn4youth.org, and we'd be happy to reference any of that information that you might have missed earlier. So those are the only other questions. Okay. Right. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulty. They're beautiful slides. So when you do see them, you'll love them. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, spending time with us. Thank you to Sierra, Charday, and Han. Um, do is there anything either of you would like to say, closing words before we sign off on this webinar? Sure. Um, I would just like to say thank you guys for, you know, putting in time and actually, you know, attending the webinar and asking questions and, you know, wanting to get educated and make changes about these things. Um, it means a lot to people like myself, Han, and as well as Sade. It just kind of puts us in a better, puts us in a better position to help the future, if that makes sense. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Hello. I just want to say thank you also for taking time out today to join this webinar to listen to our stories and the recommendations that we have for you guys. Thank you. I as well would like to say thank you. I, I know we all really appreciate your support in fighting this good fight. So thank you all. Great. Thank you all. Have a good day. Thanks.